Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, and I would just like to start by welcoming uh, so many of our uh, alumni back to campus, saying hello to all of our students and giving you a warm welcome to the HLS Bicentennial, our 200th celebration. Um, I would like to extend uh, special thanks to my colleague, Professor Richard Lazarus, and our Dean, John Manning, and our immediate past Dean, Martha Minow, for all of the work that went into this tremendous event. Uh, as many of you know, this is one of 64 panels being hosted today across the law school. We have 3,000 uh, participants coming to be in our audiences to engage in these dialogues um, as we talk about issues of the day uh, and showcase the ways in which Harvard Law School is exploring some of the most pressing questions uh, confronting our country and our world. Uh, the planning for an event this massive started uh, a year ago, uh, including the planning for this panel. So the idea for this panel was, uh, is uh, over a year old. Of course, that means that at the time that we were thinking of a panel on Puerto Rico, we were certainly aware of the economic crisis facing the island. But of course, no one uh, could have predicted the extent of the uh, humanitarian crisis that is now affecting Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying to those in our audience, those potentially watching, those on our panel who may have family in Puerto Rico, uh, that simply we hope you, uh, that we hope that they are safe. We hope that you've been able to be in touch with them. Um, to those of you in our audience and watching who are lawyers uh, or law students or paralegals, uh, I wanted to make sure you knew of a way that the bar is responding to Hurricane Maria. Uh, there's an organization called Ayuda Legal Huracan Maria, which is a volunteer effort that now has over 1,000 lawyers signed up to give legal aid uh, in response to the hurricane. And as of a week ago, my understanding is that they are having clinics uh, in four different municipalities on the island, aiming to have those up once a week. And their goal is to have legal clinics available throughout the island uh, as the resources come together. They've just recently had CLE training in New York. You can see up behind me um, three different websites for ways to participate in this. So these are all bit.ly links. So you just do bit.ly slash. And then the first one is Legal Core for PR, which is how lawyers and paralegals can sign up for that volunteer effort. If, as I suspect many of you in the room and watching are, if you are um, connected to Harvard University and want to help with that legal effort, we have started here with our Office of Clinical and Pro Bono Legal Services a Harvard chapter of this volunteer effort. And you can sign up for that if you are a student at bit.ly um, slash Harvard for PR. And if you are an alum and a lawyer who might be willing to supervise <coughs> law students as they do some of this volunteer work, please feel free to reach out to me directly. You can come up after the panel. We will be looking to um, particularly our Spanish-speaking alumni. Uh, alumni in Puerto Rico or here in Boston would be uh, wonderful resources to work with some of our students as we try and help in the aftermath of the hurricane. And finally, I'll just say that um, for anyone who wants to be able to help those in Puerto Rico uh, financially, there are various different ways to do that. Up here, I have also bit.ly slash Boston for PR, which is a link to the Boston Funds United for Puerto Rico Fund, which has been started by our mayor and our governor here and is um, helping both those in Puerto Rico and those who are resettling in Boston uh, in the wake of the hurricane. Um, the theme for today's bicentennial across the campus is uh, prepared to reason, uh, talking about the ways that our law school has prepared lawyers to go out and use their uh, understanding of the law to address major issues of the day. Um, and with that in mind, our goal here today is to look at some of the big picture legal issues that have structured the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States over the past century and more and then to connect those legal issues to some of the ongoing crises of the day. Um, in talking about the legal relationship between the US and Puerto Rico, uh, a few thoughts come to mind. Uh, one is that the relationship, notwithstanding being over a century old, is still in some basic and fundamental ways uncertain, as I think our panel will show. Uh, it is also contested in some ways. And in some ways, also controversial. A sort of there's, there's argument to be had and debate over the nature of what that relationship actually is. Um, some of that controversy, you can just see sort of hinted at in the title for our session, The Oldest Colony in the World. Uh, the idea that one of the um, 
first and leading democracies of the world might also be home to one of the oldest colonies of the world is a tension that I think we need to explore and talk through. The title, by the way, uh, for our session is, um, some might say borrowed, some might say stolen, uh, from a wonderful book on this topic called Puerto Rico, The Trials of the Oldest Colony in the World, written by Jose Trias Monge, Harvard Law School class of 1944, uh, who, was, uh, one of the, who was very influential in the sort of founding moment of the Puerto Rican Constitution, which we'll spend uh, a good part of this morning talking about and who was also um, one of the first attorneys general and a chief justice of the island. Um, the basic plan for our panel today is that we've got a wonderful uh, group of experts on this topic up here. And we're going to start with a sort of conversation amongst us that um, we're going to try to go through three basic themes. Um, so uh, the first is these are tied both sort of conceptually tied to some key cases because we are lawyers and some historical <coughs> errors to help you follow along. So the first uh, sort of theme here is looking at the years um, 1898 to 1922 and particularly the insular cases uh, and the role that they have played in structuring the rights of the uh, now roughly 3.5 million American citizens in Puerto Rico uh, and the relationship of what those rights are compared to the rest of us American citizens in the United States. Next, we're going to look at uh, a period of time at the middle of the last century, um, which was sort of the founding moment of Puerto Rico as a commonwealth, and look at uh, both what <coughs> happened during that time and then at a significant US Supreme Court case decided just uh, a, a little over a year ago. Um, that was the first time that the Supreme Court examined the significance of those legal events at the middle of the century. And then finally, we're going to talk through a bit about how this legal relationship carries forward and may be related to some of the um, issues facing the island that we all see now uh, in the news and have been uh, seeing in the news for the past couple of years. Um, as you can see from the uh, stools, this is a, borrowed from my colleague Cass Sunstein. This is a nudge to our panel that this is an informal and conversational sort of setup here. Uh, I figure that the more uncomfortable they are, the less likely they are to uh, sort of uh, speak at great Yeah, mis mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and similarly, the hope is that this will just grow into a um, conversation with all of you. So we'll um, uh, hope to sort of transition midway to just open question and answer for our audience. And if there's anything that happens before then and you have a question you'd like to jump in, just feel free to wave. This is, uh, uh, as I said, it's uh, like, like, more like a living room than a classroom is, is, is the goal. Uh, now, without any further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Um, we have Professor Pedro Rena Perez, who is a professor of history at the University of Puerto Rico, an award-winning historian and journalist, and is the Wilbur Marvin Visiting Scholar at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, which is a center at Harvard University across all of our schools for the study of issues affecting, Latin, affecting um, Latin America. Uh, and we are so uh, gracious, grateful to have him here with us. Thank you. To my immediate right, we have Christopher Landau, class of 1989, who is a partner and the head of the appellate litigation group at Kirkland and Ellis a two-time clerk at the Supreme Court for Justices Thomas and Scalia. Uh, recently, on a fairly remarkable streak as a Supreme Court litigator of having five for five cert petitions granted by the court back to back. Uh, and he, uh, in one term, was, I think, would have earned the uh, nickname the lawyer from Puerto Rico, uh, in that he represented Puerto Rico in two of the most significant cases that the court has heard. They heard them in the same term one of which we will talk about at great length here today, which is Sanchez Valle, Puerto Rico v. Sanchez Valle. The other is Puerto Rico v. the California, sorry, Franklin, California Tax-Free Trust, which you may all know more familiarly as the bankruptcy case uh, that was decided at the court. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Uh, at our far end, we have Professor Rafael Coxalomar, class of 2004, who is a professor of law at the David A. Clark School of Law at the University of the District of Columbia. He is a scholar of um, many things, including decolonization, the author of the forthcoming book, The Puerto Rico Constitution, and in 2012 was a candidate for resident commissioner. Uh, for those not familiar, resident commissioner is the only representation that Puerto Rico has in the Congress of the United States. It's a 
sort of equivalent to a congressperson, with the notable uh, difference being uh, they don't have a vote. Yeah. Uh, but so you may think small, equivalent, small, 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 small. <laughs> <laughs> equivalent and slight distinction uh, are uh, flexible words there. Uh, he was a candidate for the um, Partido Popular Democrático, which is the uh, party in Puerto Rico uh, associated with the Commonwealth status for the island. And then finally, last but not least, we have Andres Lopez, class of 1995. Andres has not uh, been a candidate for office, despite my efforts. Uh, he is an active leader of Puerto Rican and the Latino community, both at Harvard Law School and nationally, an at-large member of the Democratic National Committee, uh, past chair of the Futuro Fund with the Democratic National Committee that focused on fundraising uh, from the Latino community, and has uh, been an advocate for Puerto Rican statehood on the island. Please join me in welcoming our wonderful panel. So uh, as I sort of indicate with this outline, we're going to start off just by talking about the insular cases. And as just a, I actually don't know the, the answer to this from our panel, but three of you are graduates of this law school. And I'm just curious, when you were students here, can you recall a class in which the insular cases were mentioned, were taught, were assigned? Did any of you uh, have the insular cases in assignment when you were in law school? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll start. N not only that. I uh, Andrew, when uh, I went to Dean Martha Minow, put that question to her, you know, when you were a student, had you uh, in any way come across the insular cases? It's remarkable that the answer, and she was honest enough when we did a conference, I know you're going to talk about this later, that she said, not only did I not study them, I don't know what they are. Uh, so it's two steps uh, removed. Of course, I think any, anyone who's Puerto Rican is at least slightly uh, familiar, if not, you know, at a PhD level of knowledge about this set of cases because they provided the intellectual framework that still governs the unequal relationship between Puerto Rico and the rest of the country. But when it comes to law school, it wasn't, it, it still isn't. And perhaps this is a challenge to Harvard Law School as we celebrate its bicentennial and talk about, well, these are the important issues that should govern the, the third century. Uh, at Harvard Law. Well, this is one of the topics that, thanks to you and to Martha, uh, we, have, uh, we have been able to, to set up. So let's talk about how do we insert them into the canopies. I think they're now part of the national conversation, right? The, the fact that Puerto Rico is being talked about today mm -hmm. and that I think more than any politician, uh, you know, the idea that Puerto Ricans are Americans and should be accorded equal treatment as their fellow Americans let's say, in hurricane-ravaged Texas and Florida, uh, really harks back to what the insular cases meant and what they established, sort of unequal idea that there can be, that not all citizens are equal, which I think runs counter to everything that makes America great. So you came, you graduated in 95, yes? Yep. Um, I imagine that the two of you coming to law school from Puerto Rico had heard of the insular cases before arriving here. But but did you did you did you study them at all when you were? In let me let me basically um, share a very very brief anecdote with the uh, with the panel and with the uh, audience. Not only did I really never saw the insular cases in the canon, and I remember having this conversation with Professor David Shapiro, who was my civil procedure professor during my first year. But I remember having a conversation about this with former Chief Justice Trias Monge, uh, shortly before he died, actually. And uh, when I asked him, he told me that during the actually 50s, 60s, while he was attorney general, and then in the 70s and 80s chief justice, he had had a series of conversations with actually folks here at the law school and some faculty members of actually including the insular cases in the canon. And he had had a series of conversations with folks like Professor Tribe and others. But, but really, the cases were never included, right? So you have the case of people who are authorities in constitutional law, people who have actually taught at the best law schools in the country, and they themselves uh -huh. have never come across the insular <clears throat> cases. So the, the idea of actually including the insular cases in the canon is an old idea. Uh -huh. And it has been actually uh, attempted to by previous generations. And hopefully, under uh, Dean Manning, perhaps we can do something about it. This is so the, um, a noted constitutional law professor who is a frequent visitor here at Harvard, Sanford Levinson, sure. has written an, mm. an essay about the insular cases. And it was striking to me, reading what he said, he said, 
this is not that long ago that he wrote this, he said it would not be at all embarrassing for a leading constitutional scholar in the United States to admit that they had never heard of the insular cases, let alone never read them or taught them, uh, which I think is sort of striking. I just so I under, now, now that you know how not embarrassing it is to admit to this, I'm curious for our audience. Uh, so first, uh, how, many, how many of you are, are current students? Great. Okay. And uh, of our current students, how many of you have at least heard of the insular cases? Okay. How many of you think you could name one? Okay. And how many of you think you've read one? And, and for our alumni, how many of you are alumni in the audience? And similarly, can anyone remember be, uh, reading one of the insular cases during law school? <laughs> just, just for those watching at home, that was almost one hand. <laughs> but not, not one hand. Uh, I'm sorry? So, excellent oh, question gosh. from our audience. That's a, leading, that's a leading question right there. Uh, can I say one thing? Yes, please, please. Let me apologize first for my voice. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, what is truly shocking about this is that the insular cases in their day were among the most hotly debated yeah, sure. cases in the country. And they were cases that they were talk about litmus tests for the Supreme Court on these cases. They were cases that were absolutely discussed at a national level. I knew about the insular cases not from my time at Harvard Law School, but from my time as an undergraduate when I was a history major. And I remember seeing a picture of Uncle Sam is in a cartoon of the right. time with one foot in the Philippines yeah, sure, and one yeah, foot in Puerto little... Rico yeah. and in saying, Cuba. does the Constitution follow the flag? That was the big constitutional question of the day. And so it's not just the, the, the anomaly is not just that the cases have been obscure for the last 50 years or so. It's what's particularly shocking is that they had been such a big deal back in their day. This is a great segue because both from Judge Campos's question from the audience, we're going to get into what these cases actually are. It's a little actually. There's not. This is maybe sounds like a law professor answer, Judge Campos, but. Well, unclear actually what they are if you were to try to make a list of them. I think most people would say that there's about 23 cases between 1901 and 1922 that constitute the insular cases, although there's a series of them in 1901 that get a lot of focus. Professor Cristina Duffy Ponza, who's written extensively on this and is an expert on it, makes the case for adding five more to those 23. So even what we think the insular cases are is a bit hazy, but we're going to get into that. Um, before we get into the cases themselves, building off of Chris's sort of remarks on the history of the time and how these cases were both um, prominent and situated in a particular moment in American history. This is sort of, eight, the first of these cases is 1901, three years after uh, 1898 and the Spanish-American War when Puerto Rico becomes part of the United States, although what part of means is sort of the big question. So our, our resident historian, uh, Professor Reno Perez, could you help us just sort of situate these cases in, in their time? Help us understand what is happening in Puerto Rico, in the United States, and between these two in basically the turn of the last century uh, as this relationship is starting and then as we're getting just into the beginning of these 23 cases. Glad to do it. Uh, good morning. Um, let me go back to something I heard yesterday uh, during the opening ceremony. Uh, 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 President Faust and, and Dean Manning were talking about uh, the period in which the Harvard Law School was created, 1817, and the fact that they were uh, naming things and events and people that had been born or were things that were going on and people that were crucial to the 19th century that had not been born. But I was thinking that in 1817, the Spanish Empire was unraveling, for example. Uh, the uh, Wars of Independence had started in 1808, so there was a lot of turmoil concerning um, Spain and its colonies. By 1825, Spain had lost all of its colonies with the exception of Cuba and Puerto Rico. So uh, President Monroe uh, himself was a, a key figure in shaping um, the United States' uh, ambitions towards the continent and uh, to the Caribbean. Most of you remember the Monroe Doctrine, for example. And he was key in acquiring both Louisiana and Florida. Uh, he was the one thinking about how the e empire would expand to the Atlantic Ocean and to the Pacific Ocean. So when in 1898, Spain invaded, uh, the United States invaded Puerto Rico, you had a clash of two different type of titans. 
uh, Spain, which was an old monarchic Catholic empire, and the United States, which embodied uh, optimism, a Republican form of government. So that uh, conflict was beautifully uh, me memorialized in um, caricatures, in cartoons, yeah. as Chris was saying, that depicted uh, uh, Uncle Sam as an ambitious uh, uh, conqueror. In 1898, the United States invaded Puerto Rico. And I, I have to say this, and I will go back to it uh, in, in, in uh, numerous times. Um, we have been entrapped throughout our history in understanding our political condition in legal terms. We refer to the state of Puerto Rico as the status of Puerto Rico. And I was uh, telling Andrew at the beginning of our conversation prior to this, to this panel that one could do like an itinerary, a historical itinerary to discuss Puerto Rico around the different laws that were approved, uh, that, that have been approved or revoked in, in the Sanchez Valle case uh, during uh, this period as well. 1898, United States invades Puerto Rico. The general that leads that um, invasion, uh, General Miles, makes a statement, a public statement. We have come to liberate you. We have come to bring the values of democracy to you. And right after that, a military government is put in place. So there's a double discourse. Uh, 1898 to 1900, Puerto Rico is ruled by military law. In 1900, we get the first law the Forker Act, which grants the, go the, the island a, a civil government, but does nothing about citizenship. So from 1900, we had a, a governor appointed by the executive, as well as a, a, the, the different the cabinet. Um, and it is not until 1917 that we enter the issue of, you know, it, uh, well into the different cases that had been argued in the court um, as to what, you know, what are Puerto Ricans? Puerto Ricans are US nationals. Uh, the First World War had started in 1914. And in 1917, the United States, among other reasons, afraid of a possible German intervention in the Caribbean, grants Puerto Rican citizenship and acquires the uh, Danish Antilles at the same time. Uh, it was an attempt to say, well, you know, if you make a military move uh, against our property, you know, it's going to be worse because the people living there have citizenship. But it's a different class of citizenship. And that is something I think we can go back to uh, because it's citizenship granted by legislation. And it is do, do not entail the same uh, uh, rights as people that live here in the continental United States, as the insular cases make clear. So I'll leave it at that, and I'll come back to it. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so Pedro has brought us to the middle of this range of time, 1901 to 1922, um, to a point in time when Puerto Ricans now are US citizens under the Jones Schaffroth Act of 1917, um, but a different kind of citizenship, he says, in part because of these cases. So Rafael, I realize that um, this is, you know, a, teach in this classroom and asking a student, say, so tell me, what happened in these 23 cases? Yeah, uh, call call is, me. It's not a fair question for a student, but it's a fair question for a law professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I realized that distilling 23 to 28 cases to their essence is uh, perhaps a bit of a, of, 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 of a fictional task. But help us understand, if you were to encounter someone, say perhaps from our audience, who had never read an insular case or heard of the insular cases, and to try to tell them why these cases are so significant for Puerto Rico. What is it? What, what do the insular cases stand for? What do they hold? Why are they so significant uh, as, 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 as legal propositions? Well, you see, the insular cases, the so-called insular cases, as uh, both professors uh, Crespo and, and uh, Mr. Landau have actually suggested, we're talking about the series of cases, uh, the first batch of which was actually rendered by the court in 1901. There was, in 1901, there were a series of nine cases. Seven came from Puerto Rico, one came from Hawaii, one came from the Philippines. Then between 1903 to 1914, you had 13 cases, most of which also came from Puerto Rico. And then in 1922, under the Taft, Court, you had one case, a very significant case, that was the Balzac case. And we can go to back to that later. Now, 
what's the gist? What's the punchline, as I would tell my students, of the insular cases? The Constitution doesn't follow the flag. Congress can treat folks living in the territories differently because in the territories, the only constitutional requirement is for the fundamental rights of people to be basically enforced. So not all the provisions of the US <clears throat> Constitution actually apply in the territories, in the so-called unincorporated territories. In other words, provisions and institutions as basic as the grand jury in the context of criminal proceedings, issues uh, having to do with, uh, if you will, the unanimity of verdicts in the context of uh, in the context of uh, uh, criminal proceedings and a series of other vehicles and, and institutions that are actually uh, present in the Constitution, they actually are not required in the, ter in the, un the so-called unincorporated territories. So that's the first element I would point out, okay? Only fundamental rights, as they have been defined by the court, are applicable in so-called unincorporated territories. I mean, that's the gist from these cases. Now, the second, and perhaps the threshold question, the, thre the threshold issue that basically comes to the surface in these cases is the following. You see, between 1791, when the first territory was actually incorporated as a state. Remember, initially you had the 13 colonies, but subsequently Congress has incorporated 37 other territories into the Union, right? And in those 37 occasions, those territories, when they were actually annexed, they already had a promise of statehood. And their citizens, residents, were already conferred US citizen, right? on the basis of the series of treaties that actually led to the incorporation of these territories. So pursuant to the insular cases, the Supreme Court, for the first time in the history of the republic, creates a distinction between so-called incorporated territories and so-called unincorporated territories, the latter being a property of the US, but not a part of the US, in other words, the court for the first time basically says, there are some territories, okay, that have been promised statehood and other territories, the so-called unincorporated, which will not be groomed to statehood, and we're gonna treat them differently because we are not promising to these folks statehood because these folks have a different culture, a different language, a different historical tradition, a different sociological composition. I mean, that's why the insular cases must be looked at on the basis of what happened in the Fuller Court with Plessy v. Ferguson and other infamous cases. Because the whole notion of ethnocentrism, the whole notion of racism, was the intellectual fodder okay, for the substantiation of this new doctrine. Now, at the beginning of the discussion, uh, Mr. Lopez, for instance, right, he suggests that there's indeed a connection between the Harvard Law School and the ideology, the discourse that led to the insular cases. You see, the first batch of cases were actually resolved, the, the decisions were announced in May 27, 1901. Before that date, the Harvard Law Review had published a series of articles authored by folks as influential as the dean of the law school, Dean Landell, uh, Lowell, who would subsequently become president of Harvard, uh, Simon Baldwin, who was a Yale Law graduate who actually taught at the law school. At some point, he published in the Harvard Law Review. And the ideas that were actually adopted <laughs> subsequently by the court were discussed and thrashed out in a way in the Harvard Law Review, right? So there's the connection, perhaps, between the law school, right? and the articulation of, of this intellectual framework that lo and behold, and with this I'm gonna close, you see, Plessy was overturned in Brown. You see, the Dred Scott case was overturned by the 14th Amendment. And what about the insular cases? If you go to cases as recent as 
The Boumedin case and other cases, by way of dictum, you see that the court fundamentally substantiates the legitimacy of the insular cases. The insular cases, lo and behold, in the 21st century, they remain good law in America. And that's something that should not stand, in my estimation. So, so this is, this is a, a great lead into a question I have for, for Andres. So just to sort of sum up <laughs> Professor Cox Alomar's uh, sort of um, distillation here. This is the first time, the, the very first time that the court identifies the possibility that United States territory is not a form of pre-statehood and is in a very clear and um, bright line way divides the political community of the United States into those that are either uh, full, full members of states and citizens or on the cusp of that as happened with our westward expansion and every uh, piece of territory acquired from the original 13 colonies to the Pacific Ocean um, and create something different and says that this can be held in perpetuity. That's, you know, that, that there's no end point, there's no shelf life on uh, the colonial status or on the possession of unincorporated territory. Um, Raphael has sort of started showing some of the um, problems with the analytical framework of these cases and of some of the motivations that have driven them. Andres, you were central in organizing here at Harvard Law School a conference a few years ago titled Reconsidering the Insular Cases. And I wonder if you could speak just a bit about the motivation for that and, and, and your views on these cases. Uh, you know, as a lawyer, as a Puerto Rican, and as a Harvard alumnus, given some of the things that Rafael has said about the intellectual foundation being, uh, I think, widely acknowledged by historians of this body of law, a series of law review articles uh, in our own law review here. Yeah. Well, before I say word one about the insular cases, I want to recognize that we have here in the room today uh, someone that I consider to be one of the foremost authorities uh, and experts on the insular sure. cases, which is Judge Juan Torruella of uh, the First Circuit. <laughs> yes, that's right. There you go. <laughs> I'm, say, if, I'm sure if I'm in my exposition I say something wrong, I will be quickly uh, corrected <laughs> and rebuffed. Uh, but yeah, look, uh, let me say three things about uh, what Rafael pointed out I thought was a uh, great uh, exposition. And then that will be a lead -in into how the, uh, the Harvard uh, conference, and I think what I consider to be now our role as, Harvard, as the modern-day Harvard alumni is in pushing Harvard uh, let's say, to be on the right side of history in the same way that I think Harvard was on the wrong side of history. Back in the day, to Chris's point, the presidential election, believe it or not, of 1900, in large part turned on this issue of what we're going to do with these newly acquired territories. But so when I, I think of the insular case, I think of three fundamental points that if I didn't know anything about them, this is what I would like to sort of have as takeaways. Number one, they were decided by the Plessy Court. All right, these are the, the, the guys, because no, no, no females, that thought that separate but equal was cool, was like the right thing to decide. That's sort of the, the context in which this happened. Is it that far-fetched to believe that they reached a result having to do with these newly acquired islands, which, by the way, we were all filled with brown people, and say, you know what? I don't think so, not yet. And by the way, Andrew, I think that it, there's something important. I don't think the insular cases stand for the proposition, uh, A, that, that statehood is not within reach, or that America can hold territories in perpetuity. In fact, a very important piece of all of these cases, and a threat that actually runs modern day, is that they all intellectually asked themselves, or, or said in these opinions, but they were just going to do this little experiment of just kind of leaving the territory in a, in a state of suspension, so to speak, for a time. You'll see this word come up in a lot of the insular cases, and even in, in uh, cases in the 50s, for a time, right? Because in the dissent, right, and Judge Soroy on this has been the equivalent of the great dissenter. I think your views are going to be vindicated by history. But the dissents in these five, four cases were all about Look, having essentially running America as an empire and having territories in a, in a fundamentally in a structurally unequal state for whatever amount of time on a country that prides itself on the concept of the consent of the governed, 
That's thoroughly un-American. Eventually, all territories either have to be placed into an equal footing, they have to have a seat at the table, okay? Because if you don't, then you get what happened and you could easily, painfully feel just a few weeks ago when Maria hit. That's what happens when you don't have equality. In the history of our country, every single territory that has had American citizens without exception has moved on to achieve equality and full statehood. The Philippines, notably, which is the only territory that has not become a state, its citizens never became American citizens. And from the get-go, as Rafael will confirm, no doubt, the notion was we're going to move them towards independence. With Puerto Rico, it's been quite the opposite. We're celebrating a bicentennial this week for Harvard Law School, but we're celebrating also a centennial because in 1917, 100 years ago, Puerto Ricans became Americans. But to your point, Andrew, not quite the same level of Americans. And that's why, to me, Harvard and how this conference uh, of 2014 was born, just to place it in context, I, I had just been part of the group that helped President Obama uh, get reelected in 2012. And in Puerto Rico, the people for the first time had voted and said, we don't want the current territorial status. Uh, to continue. We want to move forward and change it, right? And it, I thought that it was an opportune moment because to me, Harvard is, uh, let's say, an intellectual father of the theory that took hold back in the day that allowed the Supreme Court to feel comfort with the idea that it was okay for a time, not forever, so they thought, here we are, you know, 100 plus years later, to hold a territory in a state of inherent inequality, its citizens being unable to have full-fledged rights unless they moved to the mainland. So it's like the JetBlue theory of constitutional law. You know, if you fly to the mainland, you get all rights. And if you move back, you get truncated uh, rights. Now, I'll give all the credit in the world to Dean Martha Minow because I flew uh, to Cambridge shortly after the election. Again, the idea was that both the federal government and Harvard as a leading intellectual center, and now with feeling an obligation as alumni, that we should move Harvard, again, to be on the right side of history. And to Martha's credit, even though she didn't know about the Insular cases, she became aware of it and came to the conclusion that I think anybody who reads up on this uh, comes to, which is, this isn't right. And so she promoted the idea of pushing a conference and later a book, and I think is, is nudging, because I think Harvard Law Review came, came with uh, an, an issue recently on this issue. So we're nudging Harvard. I think Dr. King's uh, quote about the moral arc of history being long, long but bending towards justice, I think that Puerto Rico is poised for change uh, because of all the seismic shifts that have taken place in recent years. And I really want Harvard to be on the right side of history. Of all the insular cases, though, if you ask me which is the one that's like the most Plessy-like in my mind, it's the 1922 case called Balzac. Now, why Balzac? Before Balzac, okay, all these cases at the turn of the century, they're pretty bad in their own right, you know, Plessy court, but they were still held in a context where Puerto Ricans weren't Americans, not yet American citizens, until 1917. Balzac is so bad because it's the first case in American history where now Puerto Ricans are American citizens and the court says to Puerto Rico, we can actually, it actually says in effect, no, American citizens are not all equal. And to me, that's the most fundamentally un-American thing or one of the most fundamentally un-American things that's come out of the court. So, if I'm looking to overturn uh, a case going forward, I'm looking at Harvard to get involved, is to overturn the basic premise, the premise of Balzac. It's either full equality and a seat at the table or something else. But what we have right now, I think it's been shown, uh, is unsustainable. So let me add, the benefit of those who haven't read Balzac, I think that dress is being charitable. It not only holds that US citizens resident in Puerto Rico are not equal, but they are explicitly inferior because they do not have the intellectual and moral capacity to exercise That's a great point. rights. 
Yeah. So this is this is this is exactly the thank you because this is the, my my last question on this set of cases before we we move to the middle of the ninth of the century. Is is exactly the sort of point that your question raises. So as Andres says, we have uh, an, an expert in residence, uh, Judge Torhuea here, and Andres mentioned. Uh, you'll see that I'm developing a reading list for you as we go through. <laughs> uh, so the panel that Andres organized was called Reconsidering the Insular Cases, and it produced this excellent uh, anthology of essays edited by two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Jerry Newman and Professor Tomiko Brown-Nagan. Uh, and it includes uh, the keynote address that Judge Torhuea gave at that conference. Uh, and he stated in very, I think, trenchant and poignant terms some of the themes that we are hearing come out here. I want to just read you a, a little bit of what he said. He said, the insular cases represent classic Plessy v. Ferguson legal doctrine and thought that should be eradicated from present day constitutional reasoning. They were flawed when decided because they directly clashed with our constitution, were disobedient to controlling constitutional jurisprudence in place at the time, and contravened without exception every single historical precedent and practice of territorial expansion since our beginning as a nation. In her introduction to this same anthology, our immediate past dean, um, I think put it perhaps even uh, finer on the head, saying that the cases <coughs> represent, quote, the presumed white supremacy of their time. We've been speaking about these cartoons that were sort of um, a big part of, you know, you can all think of what, you know, these like political cartoons of, of earlier eras look like. I have uh, in mind one that um, Professor Rena Perez uh, showed me early on, which was um, Uncle Sam dressed in a United States sort of leotard like an acrobat, balancing what are clear caricatures supposed to be the kind of tribal savages uh, on his head and on his arms, um, showing this idea that our, our, our uh, question uh, from, from, from our guest hi highlights and that our dean says, this idea that a fundamental key part of the logic of these cases is that these people uh, aren't capable these of full citizenship mm -hmm. and as a result aren't deserving of full citizenship. So here's my last question for the panel on the insular cases. Um, given this, you know, law professors sometimes talk, perhaps in uh, overly uh, law professory words, about something that called the anti-canon. We can all think of the canon of constitutional law. The canon are the cases that, you know, if you're a lawyer in America, You've heard of it, and you've read it, and Marbury. you can talk about it. Marbury, Marbury. versus Madison, mm -hmm. which might come out differently today at 4 p.m. for anyone who wants to uh, <laughs> see uh, our re-argument as part of our bicentennial. Um, but there's also an idea of the anti-canon. Um, Korematsu, Dred Scott, Plessy v. Ferguson. As Professor Cox Alomar says, um, Plessy v. Ferguson is overruled. Right? In perhaps the most famous canonical case that you don't have to be a lawyer to have heard about. Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah. Dred Scott overturned by the Civil War and the Constitutional Amendment. Korematsu, though technically never overturned, anti-canonical in the sense of overturned by affirmation, overturned by our collective understanding that as a lawyer you cannot cite Korematsu favorably <laughs> in a court. Uh, by contrast, the insular cases are not only not anti-canonical, they are good law. They are cited as propositions in support of holdings in courts across the country. So here's my, my last question on the answer cases. How does that happen? How does it happen that you can have the dean of Harvard Law School say these are cases founded on white supremacy? You can have a leading judge of the First Circuit and an expert on these things say uh, that they are the Plessy v. Ferguson uh, sort of you know, um, co-traveler. How do we get, and you know, Andre says, well, they, they, they had a shelf life. It was only for a time. Sure, but it's been a while. Um, yeah. So how, how does that happen? How, how, do we, how do we get that these are still cited this way? Let me say this. The, the, there is no doubt that there is truly offensive language in these cases, and there is reasoning that I think is very anti-canonical. So I will totally grant that. I do think, though, that it is fair to say that the insular cases arose because these territories that were acquired in the 1890s, that starting with Hawaii and then uh, those in the Spanish-American War, were really different in kind than the territories that the United States was used to having acquired beforehand in, through the westward expansion. They had uh, a, a, a very uh, developed 
uh, civilization already on point with its own uh, elaborate legal system that was different. I think there was really, putting aside all the, the language and the you know, little brown brothers mentality of that time, there was an attempt to deal with something that was unprecedented in U.S. history, which is how does this republic come to fit within its constitutional structure these, these very developed countries? We, we just didn't have an experience with that, and the Constitution really gave no guide. I mean, all there is in the Constitution is a line in the Territorial Clause, Article 4, <laughs> Section 3, Clause 2, that says Congress shall have power over the territory and property of the United States. That means basically that's as much guidance over these over territories as it is over a desk in the Interior Department. It's all in that's the one clause that just gives Congress power. So I think it was a, a very I think there's a, a, a problem that the cases are addressing that's a problem that's still being played out in modern Puerto Rican politics, which is in a sense, there is a sense that there's a different culture, that this is not that Puerto Rico is not the Utah Territory, that there's something uh, that is different about these kind of territories. And what about Louisiana and French culture? I mean, well, I mean but, but, in the, but in the context of Louisiana, if you look at the Purchase Treaty that was basically negotiated and signed between Jefferson and Napoleon, first of all, folks in the Louisiana Territory were immediately conferred on the basis of the treaty U.S. citizenship. There was a promise of statehood, right? Forthcoming with a treaty. I mean, in the context, and obviously, and I think maybe uh, Mr. Landau is very, very diplomatic here, but Puerto Rico is an island, right? And when the General Miles came <clears> over, <throat> right, we had 950,000 people living in that island. It was impossible to depopulate Puerto Rico and to bring folks from the Northeast to populate Puerto Rico. You see, the sociological experiment that was the basis of the westward expansion in America, that experiment was unviable in the Puerto Rican context. Right? So when Mr. Landau says that there was this developed legal civilization, etc., what really we're saying here is that, you see, it was impossible to dismantle right? the Puerto Rican nationhood and take all the folks from Puerto Rico out of Puerto Rico and bring folks from the north and populate Puerto Rico following the blueprint of what happened in the continent right, during the 19th century. You see, the other thing, in a nutshell, right, that I want people to understand here is the following. The intellectual history of American imperialism did not be begin in the late 19th century. If you read Benjamin Franklin before the founding of the Republic, Benjamin Franklin is already thinking about Cuba, about the possible acquisition of Cuba. In 1809, okay, 1809, eight years before the founding of the Harvard Law School, Thomas Jefferson had commissioned a delegation to go to Cuba and negotiate with Spain the purchase of Cuba. Ulysses Grant, the famous Ulysses Grant, he negotiated a treaty of annexation of the Dominican Republic, 1870 or so. And it was defeated in the Senate, 28 to 28. The invasion of Mexico under James Knox Polk, 1844. I mean, all these things were happening, right? The Monroe administration turning down Bolivar when Bolivar basically asked Monroe to send delegates to the Panama Convention, 1826. All these things mean that all of a sudden it wasn't as if William McKinley and Grover Cleveland in the 1890s decided, oh, America should be an empire. No, 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 no. This is a, an intellectual idea that had been brewing since the founding of the Republic, okay? So I want folks to understand this, right? It so it happened that in the context of the Louisiana territories, in the context of the Mexico territories, in the context of the Oregon territory, in the context of the Northwest Ordinance territory, Congress and the political branches dealt with the whole situation differently because the sociological inheritance <clears throat> and the realities on the ground were different than what happened in the context of Puerto Rico. And by the way, the Philippines, because Andres mentioned the Philippines, you know how many Americans died in Manila 
You know how many Filipinos died on Manila Bay? The Filipinos put up resistance. They fought. Obviously, it was impossible to annex the Philippines as a state or as an unincorporated territory forever because there was a strong separatist movement in the Philippines that was willing to do anything to gain their independence. And the last thing I want to say in this parenthesis is not only does Harvard Law School have a connection to the Puerto Rican dilemma on the basis of the insular cases, and this is something that never, never gets mentioned, which I discussed with Dean Mino, and that is there's the Albizu Campos connection to the Harvard Law School. Puerto Rico's most important nationalist leader is a Harvard Law School alum, Pedro Albizu Campos, class of 1923, who actually was the guy who engineered one of the more ferocious resistance against the US imperialism. And he was actually influenced by Irish nationalism here at the Harvard Law School because the free, Iran, the free Irish movement had actually a stronghold in Harvard Law School, 1920s. This is the place where Albizu Campos was actually exposed to Irish Catholic nationalism, right? And then he took those ideas to Puerto Rico, right? So everything hasn't bad with the influence Harvard Law School has had in the Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's an anecdote. Hawaii, Hawaii is so far away. Of course, three times actually farther than to the mainland than Puerto Rico is. But in the insular, oh, it, but, but there's, in no, there's no, I mean, look, there's going to be argument from friends uh, on all sides, but our history is one of either equality or inequality. It's, we, we can relitigate the past as much as we want. Talking about 2017 and what America is and fast forwarding what it, what it wants to be, okay? We have, you know, the United States of, of 100 years ago, it's not the United States of today. What's the, what's the number one hit of the summer? Uh, in the United States. Despacito. Despacito. <laughs> All the way from uh, Puerto Rico. But, you know, it, it, culturally, uh, you know, in places like Florida, okay, uh, the Puerto Rican community is, the, its center of gravity is shifting to a state that has 29 electoral votes in the race for president. And if you don't think that both parties are looking at that phenomenon extremely closely, <laughs> And its implications, in the same way that when the Cuban fulcrum moved to Florida in the 50s and 60s, people started paying attention all of a sudden uh, to Cuban issues. That's going to happen uh, well, is, when it is, comes to Puerto Rico. This is a great um, sort of uh, segue to our, to our sort of middle bullet point here. Because if they're bracketing all of these sort of um, deep, both sociological and, and logical problems with the insular cases, one of their major upshots is moving the ball to Congress in, in terms of defining the political relationship with, with Puerto Rico. In other words, by saying that Congress gets to decide which territories are incorporated or not and gets to structure their governments and the relationship, um, Congress takes on a, a leading role in figuring out what exactly is the status of Puerto Rico. And we then have, in the middle of the last century, this sort of um, defining moment, which is the birth of a commonwealth. So Puerto Rico, uh, we've now gone through the, the early part of the century, the insular cases. We have citizenship conferred, um, but still under, so for example, not a fully elected local legislature uh, when citizenship is conferred, not an elected governor. Uh, but those things start to change, and there is a measure of self-governance uh, but a somewhat ambiguous uh, creation of self-governance. Um, so what's one thing that is striking about this, so this is basically 1947 to 1952 is the main set of years we're looking at, during which Puerto Ricans um, get the right to elect their governor and then have this sort of key um, moment, uh, a, the founding of the Puerto Rican Constitution and a central law um, redefining their relationship with the United States. That law was not directly examined by the Supreme Court until just over a year ago uh, in a case, Puerto Rico v. Sanchez Valle, that, as I said at the outset, argued by my friend Chris Landau here. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk a bit about that case and about this relationship. And Chris, maybe you can just um, help us get into the, the background here by de describing those five years and just helping sort of put on the table for folks the sort of significant laws that were at the foundation of the case that you argued. Sure. And, and 
One point I, I just want to emphasize again is that the imperialist urge in the United States that really reached its apex in the 1890s was never a unanimous view in the United States. It was something that really uh, was always the cause for That's a true. lot of division within the United States. And uh, the pendulum kind of swung back and forth. I mean, in the 1890s, it was very cool to have different countries, different parts of the world with your color on it, like the British Empire, the French, and the Americans wanted to get in that game. But certainly, by the time the Second World War ended and the United States was the leading founder of the United Nations and was pushing for uh, democracy and uh, self-government, self-determination, these were all very powerful forces. And don't forget, this was also a very liberal moment within the United States domestic politics. This was the New Deal crowd. And, um, the, the, there was a, a view that it was embarrassing for the United States to have non-self-governing uh, territories and, and essentially colonies. And so starting in 1947, right after the war, uh, they passed the Elected Governor Act. And for the first time in American history, uh, a territory had its governor popularly elected by the people as opposed to being appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and so uh, Governor Luis Munoz Marin, who's really, I think, the father of the Commonwealth in many ways, was uh, elected the governor. And uh, that uh, led to more demands from Puerto Rico for change in the status there, uh, which culminated in 1950 in Public Law 600 that the Congress uh, offered Puerto Rico really something very novel in American history. It said, in the form of a compact, this is kind of an unusual, in the nature, uh, in the nature of a compact, um, this is something kind of ambiguous and unusual, uh, and I think you'll be hearing a lot of this word ambiguity, uh, because th these are not uh, uh, structures or, or um, legal arrangements that really have any precedent in American history. It offered uh, the people of Puerto Rico the right to create their own constitution. So they were not just delegating power to a local government in Puerto Rico like they have in, let's say, in D.C. or in other uh, territories, like even the Virgin Islands to this day. What they were saying is, people of Puerto Rico, you can go and enact your own, we invite you to enact your own constitution. The people of Puerto Rico passed a referendum uh, accepting that invitation. They scheduled a constitutional convention that took place about 1951 and 1952. That was then approved by the voters of Puerto Rico. And so Puerto Rico, through an act by the people of Puerto Rico, invited by Congress, to be sure, in, in the nature of a compact, but nonetheless an act that says, we the people of Puerto Rico hereby set up our government. and. This becomes a very important uh, thread in the Sanchez Valle case. Uh, what, what is the source of authority of Puerto Rican law? And uh, the Constitution of Puerto Rico is really quite fulsome on making clear that the Constitution of Puerto Rico is not a creature of the United States Congress in any conventional sense. It is a creature of the people of Puerto Rico who came up with this constitutional convention. They, they ratified their constitution. They had to send it to Congress for approval. Um, and Congress rewrote it. Well, I, you know, that's maybe, no, I mean, like, Congress, in fairness, I mean, they made some changes. I mean, obviously, there's room for debate on how significant the changes. Here's, the, here's this line on the, you know, this clause. No, Article 20. There was one significant yes. uh, clause. It was changed, but the structure. By Congress. By, no, there's so, no question. So much for the whole, you know, hey, oh, Puerto Rico. But, but Puerto Rico accepted the change. And, and oh, okay. We have no choice. It's well, like a plan amendment. I'm just telling. There's a, Here's I'm the a historian. Hey, <laughs> we can talk about that. I'm just telling the, the way it went down. So it's fair. It's so fair I'm, I'm having a flashback. Right. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I sat, I think, in this room about two years ago over here while Chris was standing there mooting, mooting yeah. Sanchez Valle. Um, and you're hearing the, uh, the version of these events <laughs> that Chris presented to the Supreme Court admirably there, admirably here, uh, but to open to some, to some debate and dispute. So let's sort of tie this to this case now, right? So Chris is just giving us the basic points of 47 to 52, right? 47, you have an elected governor. Luis Munoz Marin is, is, is elected. Uh, and then this sort of 
curious exchange between Congress and what to that point all acknowledges its territory, an invitation to call a constitutional convention, a constitutional convention called in Puerto Rico, the um, promulgation of a document that opens with a preamble similar to the U.S. Constitution, we the people of Puerto <coughs> Rico, uh, hereby establish this constitution. Uh, that constitution, though, then, unlike the United States Constitution, not sent out for ratification among the populace that is its sort of potential source, its demos, its, its source of authority, but actually sent back to Washington, D.C. for approval, for revision. Revisions entered, sent back to Puerto Rico, with the clear understanding that the revisions are... Um, they're mandatory. Why not? They're, they're mandatory. Why not? Not but, but, the, but the thing... Please... Let's not forget the geopolitical context, okay? Because while the United States, as Andrew suggests and Chris suggests, quote unquote, invites Puerto Rico to draft a constitution, the Dutch, by 1942, the Dutch are already negotiating tremendous autonomy to Aruba, Curaçao, San Martin, uh, Suriname. The French are in the midst of actually mm. passing the law of 1946 departmentalizing Martinique, Guadalupe, and the British have begun the process that's going to lead to the independence of Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago. The African colonies have been basically uh, decolonized. And India right, has already achieved independence, and Ceylon and Pakistan. It is the era of decolonization. The Cold War has begun. And the US has to come up with a policy somehow perhaps some sort of quasi-colonial disengagement, right, to save face at the height of the Cold War, right? So that's basically what, that's the geopolitical context. That's the jigsaw puzzle. Within that jigsaw puzzle, then, one then needs to understand the legal aspects. Because this is about politics. This is about geopolitics more so than about legalese, right? That's what I wanted to So when, when Chris describes what happens in this sort of constitutional moment of Puerto Rico, he says, oh, there's a constitution that is not derived from Congress's authority, but rather is grown from the authority of the Puerto Rican people, which actually in a sort of central way becomes the issue, essentially, in Sanchez Valle. <laughs> Uh, although a curious case. So um, Sanchez Bay, I'll let Chris, I don't, I'll let him talk about it since he got to talk about it to the Supreme Court. Um, but the oddity of it is it's a criminal, it's a criminal case. On, on one level, it is dealing with, and I can say this because I, I teach this, and you know, I'm a criminal law professor and a criminal procedure pro professor, so I can say it's a somewhat technical sub-doctrine of criminal procedure. This is a, it was a double jeopardy case. Okay. Do you this, teach Sanchez Valle in your in your classes? I haven't taught that Shame class until. Shame on you, until... Andrew <laughs> <laughs> Shame <laughs> on you, the Puerto Rican professor at Harvard Law School. They have no one in okay? <laughs> <laughs> what I was about to say was I have not taught that class since the case came out. Oh, okay. So give me a chance, <laughs> please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, so this is a double jeopardy case where, to just sort of put it in context for both our students and folks who haven't read it, um, you have the U.S. attorney. There is a U.S. attorney in Puerto Rico. There is a U.S. district court in Puerto Rico. The U.S. attorney, a federal uh, prosecutor in Puerto Rico, prosecutes Mr. Sanchez Valle for an offense, a firearm offense, secures a conviction, I believe by plea. If I'm yes. Secures a plea agreement. Then Puerto Rico also has, just like every state in the country, the equivalent of a state criminal justice system, a district attorney, if you will, who comes to Mr. Sanchez Valle after this plea agreement, after a conviction, and prosecutes him for the same weapons, the same violation. And um, Mr. Sanchez Valle says, double jeopardy. I've already been prosecuted for this. I can't be prosecuted again. Now, this curious sub-doctrine here is something called the dual sovereign doctrine. And already now the name makes you think, perhaps, oh, this might be somewhat significant for Puerto Rico. Dual sovereign doctrine, even if you've read nothing about this, you might be able to deduce that it depends on there being two sovereigns, uh, which is how it plays out in states. So for example, had this happened in New York, Mr. Sanchez Valle would have no claim. He has no double jeopardy claim because the federal government gets one shot at a prosecution and New York gets one shot at a prosecution under our constitutional law. Why? They are both sovereigns. Each sovereign gets one shot at someone under our double jeopardy setup. So it's not the same offense. The idea is that if it's created by a different sovereign, even though it involves the same underlying acts, you are not 
can put twice in jeopardy for the same offense, because one is the New York offense and one is the federal offense. Right. So now you can see exactly how this <clears throat> tees up at the court, which is the question is on some level, look, can the federal government and the Puerto Rican government prosecute someone for the, the same uh, crime or not? But that very quickly keys us into a dual sovereign doctrine, and as a result, a question that goes right to the heart of 1952, <coughs> and essentially, do we have two sovereigns here, or do we have just one? So Chris, tell us a bit of just sort of how this plays out through the court, and what, how, how, you, how you read the arguments and the outcome of this, of this case. Sure. First, just to, to finish up on the 1952 um, process, because it's very important. It, the, the culmination of that process was the creation of something called, in English, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Now, you all have probably heard of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Virginia. In a sense, it's a meaningless legal term. It doesn't have any, it doesn't mean anything. It's, for, for those um, states, it's just a historical anomaly that they, they happen to have the, the name Commonwealth, but it doesn't have any, any real, um, a, any legal significance that makes them different from the state of New Hampshire. Uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, the, the word commonwealth, uh, I think, kind of captures the essence of this very ambiguous status, because what is a commonwealth? It, it was something new, and uh, in Spanish, it's, as I think most people in this room probably know, Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico. So it means free associated state of Puerto Rico, which is, you know, obviously connotes something somewhat different than just the more plain vanilla word commonwealth. Uh, but anyway, so we have this kind of strange push-me-pull-you creature that is coming out of 1952 that the, the, the um, Puerto Rico is, um, you know, it, it's affiliated with the United States but has a fair degree of autonomy. And, uh, you know, in that period, the, the criminal laws of Puerto Rico are, in fact, passed pursuant to the Constitution of Puerto Rico by the uh, the um, legislature. legislature of Puerto Rico and approved by the governor there. Laws of Puerto Rico are not subject to uh, veto by uh, Congress. And in fact, until Promesa, we'll, we'll get ahead to that in a second, you know, Congress was not directly interfering in the internal governance of Puerto Rico from this 1950 period onwards. So basically, as I think Andrew really well put it, this is a case on two levels. On one level, it's just a straightforward double jeopardy case, just a straightforward criminal case. What gets everybody's blood all exciting and why it was such a big deal on the island and why the Puerto Rico Supreme Court spent about 400 pages, all of which we had to translate for the, the Supreme Court. Uh, and you can imagine, like, you know, highly technical language was not an easy feat. Um, it, the, 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 all of a sudden, it's the first case that looks like it really presents the status issue front and center, because the question is, is Puerto Rico a separate sovereign? And then that seems to really go to the question, what is the legitimacy of the Commonwealth? Did the Commonwealth really create a sovereign entity within the American family? Or is it, as I think some of the people who come from a more stated perspective, uh, really a moment at which they can show that the Commonwealth is kind of a sham, that basically, notwithstanding the window dressings of sovereignty, there really is no sovereignty. So everybody is very geared up uh, in, in Puerto Rico uh, to want to wanna fight on this sovereignty issue. And I think, you know, again, I'm sure we'll have different perspectives on the case. Uh, you know, we, I represent the government of Puerto Rico here in the case, and we said, that it fit within the historical meaning of the dual sovereignty clause because the source of authority for the Puerto Rican law at issue was not delegated authority from Congress as it might be, let's say, in Washington, D.C., where the local home rule government was nonetheless exercising delegated power but was the separate source of the Puerto Rico Constitution. And the court didn't deny that, but the court said, look, the inquiry for double jeopardy purposes is not sovereignty as one might ordinarily think of it in a political philosophy sense. It's a very narrow historical inquiry, which is you trace it to the ultimate source of authority. And they picked up on one quote in one of these cases that <clears throat> used that word ultimate and kind of made that the linchpin of the analysis. And we couldn't deny that the ultimate source of all the developments in Puerto Rico had been authority from Congress. And so... The court said, based on this 
um, very narrow and, and specific definition of sovereignty in the double jeopardy context, we're going to say Puerto Rico does not qualify as a dual sovereign. But the court was very clear to point out, in my view, and again, we might have different perspectives on how to read the opinion, that they, that they <laughs> did not take a position on the broader sovereignty implications of this in the more political sense of what you might mean by sovereignty, that they were deciding this case as a narrow double jeopardy case. Uh, and so, so this is great because we got to see the, the, the some of our students got to see the moot of this argument before it happened. Now we get to see the post game moot where we disagree <laughs> over what the opinion says. The autopsy uh, of. Uh, uh, now, let me just sort of for, for our audience tip. So this is an opinion. Um, I will say that I feel some modest personal connection to this, and that is one of the few opinions in which the majority was written by one justice for whom I for whom I clerked, and the dissent was written by another justice for whom I, for whom I also clerked. <laughs> and they, they, usually, they, they, they usually agree. So Justice, Justice Elena Kagan wrote the majority opinion that I think Chris has summed up well in that it was um, a very um, careful opinion that I think went to lengths to try to say, this is a case about double jeopardy. That's right. Okay? Yeah. This is a case about double jeopardy. Um, we're not deciding the ultimate status of Puerto Rico. Um, however, the logic of the case is Puerto Rico doesn't get the dual sovereign exception because there's only one sovereign here, and that's the Congress of the United States. Um, the dissenting opinion, written by my other uh, justice, Justice Stephen Breyer, uh, and joined by, I believe, only one other justice, Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, and I will just note parenthetically and biographically, knowing um, these three people somewhat, uh, that Justice Sotomayor and Justice Breyer both feel a very um, deep connection to yes. Puerto Rico and a yes. deep understanding of the island and its relationship yes. to the United States. Justice Breyer served for many years on the First Circuit, which is, Puerto Rico is part of the First Circuit uh, and has spent a lot of time studying these issues. And you see a division in these opinions. Um, so I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm curious, given that, if we could take just a few minutes and talk about the reaction to this opinion uh, given that we're already, I can see you guys, you know, uh, Andres is now like, look, wait, wait, wait. notwithstanding the uncomfortable stools, everyone is all sort of ready to go. So what, what was the reaction to this? Well, perhaps Andres can, you can address the reaction. I just want to make a very quick point regarding the case itself. Uh, you see, the, the problem, you see, for the proposition raised by, by Chris is, you see, the First Circuit had answered this question in Lope Andino and in a series of previous cases. Authored by? Right there, 30 years ago. Had been uh, the First Circuit. Everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but Just the first. But, the, the but <laughs> you know, and uh, what I want our students here, right, to realize is the First Circuit had a answered the question in the opposite direction on the basis of the idea that indeed there was a compact between Puerto Rico and the United States, okay? In other words, the Supreme Court faced for the first time the question the First Circuit had actually addressed on the basis of Puerto Rico's alleged wonderful covenant with Congress, whereby we were sovereign as well for purposes of the double jeopardy clause. Supreme Court basically overturned the First Circuit. And it overturned the First Circuit, and in doing so, it really threw to the wayside the whole compact theory that had been so carefully elaborated by the First Circuit itself and by the political leadership in Puerto Rico since the 1950s. Folks like Car Calvert Magruder, who was a judge in the First Circuit in the 50s and others, they articulated a compact theory whereby Puerto Rico was indeed sovereign for purposes of, among other things, the double jeopardy clause, the 11th Amendment, and other things. So obviously, when the justices of the court met in conference, right, and it seems to me obvious from Justice Breyer's dissent, the compact theory was put to the test at the Supreme Court's conference. And obviously, a majority of the Supreme Court justices have actually said in Sanchez Valle, in my estimation, that the compact theory doesn't stand. That the rationale articulated by the First Circuit has no legs, you see? And so that's let's why. Let's put a fine point on this compact theory, what that means. Just so at the end of the day, if you were to say this, I think, in a sentence, 
Look, there is a well-standing principle of law in the United States that a Congress cannot bind a future Congress. In other words, you can't pass a statute that says this statute can never be repealed. Every Congress gets to come along and change a statute. A compact might be different than that. A compact sounds a bit more like a contract, and the kind of idea being that once you have entered a compact with someone else, you both need to want to change it. And at the end of the day, the logic of Sanchez Valle is that if Congress wanted to, tomorrow, it did, yeah. erase the Puerto Rican Constitution, it has the full authority to do that. If Congress wanted to change the statute, not the compact, the statute is how I think the court's logic goes, uh, it can do that because this is just one of however many thousands of federal laws we have. Uh, and I, 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 we see that in the, the, the logic of the opinion, notwithstanding, again, I think, and I say this not just because I, I, I have to <laughs> under the um, you know, perpet, per, per, perpetual loath, uh, oath of loyalty to Justice Kagan, uh, but they, notwithstanding an opinion that actually tries very hard course, to yes. massage that, that's, that's the, 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 I think the, the compact theory is there. So then this leaves us then in this situation. I want to sort of uh, close on this because we've heard now a bunch of times about how <laughs> It creates a, a push me pull you to borrow from Chris a, a, a status situation that is in the middle and without much other um, precedent, and that returns us, I think, to the insular cases. One of the most infamous of them, or famous, Downs v. Bidwell, has a line in it that says that Puerto, so this is 1901, I believe, um, has a line that says Puerto Rico is foreign to the United States in a domestic sense. These talk are about, talk about push me, pull euphemisms you. of the era to say. Yes. Uh, <laughs> euphemism. I mean, this. Uh, yes, I suppose if, if it's you know wet in a dry sense or right. hot in a cold right. sense. Right. Because separate, um, separate but equal yes, already taken. Yes, you know, yes, so. <laughs> Deliberate so, speed. Yeah. So this is your last reading assignment. So there's an excellent book uh, called Foreign in a Domestic Sense, and I want it um, uh, edited by uh, Christina Duffy. Uh, and uh, Burke Marshall that captures, again, some writings from Judge Torruella. Uh, and I want to just use that as a segue for our last 10 minutes to the kind of contemporary nature of these issues. Yeah. Because one of the things that um, Professor Ponza writes in describing this, this phrase, this memorable phrase, foreign in a domestic sense, she says that this makes Puerto Ricans, quote, doubly marginal, neither fully domestic nor fully foreign. And as a result, quote, devoid of both voting representation in the federal government and independent status on the international stage. As a result, quote, they are at the top of nobody's agenda, yet also stripped of the power to set their own. Now, when you hear that, to me, that actually describes um, you know, the news. Uh, that describes what we've seen uh, happening in Puerto Rico the top of nobody's agenda, and devoid of the power to set their own. Uh, I, this may be a bit editorializing, but when you are faced with a crisis as a uh, political community of 3.5 million people, an economic crisis followed by a uh, natural disaster and a humanitarian crisis, the inability to set your own agenda, and yet the uh, political reality that you may not be on the top of anyone else's, can be quite severe uh, as a problem for, for a community and uh, uh, is a problem now for Puerto Rico. Uh, 